This uh, lecture is new, by the way. It's um, basically going to be the, the corresponding, um, here's how to do the assignment type things at a high level, obviously. I'm not going to say, here's all the code, um, to the Project 5 discussion we had, which I also want to lecture Phi. I think that's something that we need to have for next year, is how to tackle virtual memory so that uh, people know sort of what in the world they're going to be dealing with. So anyway, project six is to implement, I shouldn't say implement because you already have a file system, but you have to improve it in project six. And so I have this note, which I already um, blathered on about that uh, please ask before using late tokens on project six so that I don't get completely screwed over because I have to grade all of these 20 odd submissions in about two days. And I'm not looking forward to it. I know I'm paid to do that, but um, when we don't have TAs for a class, I don't get the TAs money. I wish I did because then I'd be really happy to do the extra grading, but I don't. I get paid the same amount. So uh, anyway, the uh, initial Pintos file system has all these limitations, which if you've read Project 6, you're probably already aware of all of these. Uh, files are basically a single contiguous extent, and they can't grow once they're created. So those are two things that you have to resolve. Um, there's only a single root directory in the file system, and it can hold a tiny amount of directory entries. So you can hold up to 16 entries. I know that uh, should be enough for anyone. But uh, anyway, we need to resolve those issues. And then also, the file system is not thread safe. Kernel thread safe, you can only use it by one kernel thread at a time. So these are all things that have to be changed. So extendable files don't require contiguous space on disk. Directories that can grow to hold more file entries as needed. Directory hierarchies, and then support for fast concurrent access from many kernel threads. Okay, so I'm going to try to talk about most of these topics, if not all of them, today, and try to point out sort of the biggest icebergs that you need to be aware of, and uh, how you might consider uh, tackling those things. Now, this is the suggested order of implementation from the assignment write-up itself. So, buffer cache, they say, do that first, and I think that's a great idea, because it will basically force you to think about concurrency from the very beginning. The concurrency in this lab is probably the hardest concurrency that you have to do for the entire term. I think that's true. Um, it kind of has all the fun and excitement of the virtual memory system, plus all the fun and excitement of the threading lab. And, uh, you know, then you also have the fact that kernel threads can pause for... Uh, you know, millions of clocks waiting for the disk controller to come back. So anyway, it's good to think about that stuff in the very beginning. Extendable files, which they suggest using an ext2-like file layout um, that is not required. But what is probably required is that you must do some kind of multi-level indexing because a single level of index is... Why, let me put it this way. A single sector of inode data is basically impossible to utilize to uh, address 8 megabyte files. That's partly why they pick the size limit that they do. It's not humongous, but it's enough to force you to think about real file system implementation issues. Also, you don't have to support shrinking, and that is actually going to be really helpful when it comes to supporting file extension. Subdirectories, you need to support that. And then uh, re remaining miscellaneous items is what they say you should do last. Now, what the remaining miscellaneous items are is not made clear, but this was my guess. Um, you have certain things that have to be updated as far as uh, the current directory of a process. You have to actually start maintaining that. Um, navigating directory paths from the directory hierarchy. And then you also have these two weird things, read ahead and write behind, which I'll basically tell you how to implement. Um, because there's a really simple solution that, again, 85% of teams instantly identify, and then 15% of teams don't, and I hate reading crappy code. So I'm going to tell you what you need to do for that uh, so that it's pretty straightforward to implement. And the assignment suggests that you can implement 2 and 3 in parallel, which is probably true. I think 4 probably also, depending on what falls into 4, can be done in parallel as well. Uh, once the buffer cache is in place, everything else sort of can progress on its own. Although I have a feeling that you should get the buffer cache done really early because you'll, that's probably where the nastiest and most annoying bugs will reside. Although you already saw that kind of thing in virtual memory, so you should be okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, concurrent access. What do we mean by this? So um, file extension is the only thing that should really block anybody. If you have 
Well, that's not true. If you have writes, uh, concurrent writes to the same block, then they should really block each other as well. Um, but you have files that are read and written by multiple concurrent processes. Extension needs to be atomic simply so it'll be correct. Readers should basically never block each other. They can be blocked by writers. Writes to different parts of a file should not block each other. And uh, generally we talk about this as being true on a per sector basis. And readers shouldn't see data written by writers until the write actually completes. And again, this can be true on a per sector basis. Uh, you'll notice that Project 6 is pretty lenient on the actual set of correctness guidelines. I, they, they leave some of these things vague um, just because they don't want to constrain you in your implementation too much. They want to make sure you can do uh, something that makes sense to you and as long as it satisfies the general requirements then you're okay. Directory operations on different directories should be concurrent. If they're on the same directory, they can block each other. That should be perfectly fine. Um, and the upshot of all of this is that after Project 6 is completed, you should not have a global file system lock. Okay. And uh, almost always I see a few people who try to get away. I don't know if they really try to get away with it or if they are just uh, exhausted because this course is exhausting. And by the end they just kind of forgot to take out the global lock or they take it out and suddenly tests start failing intermittently and so they put it back and hope for the best. Um, but basically, since concurrency is a huge requirement for this project, I impose a pretty severe penalty if you do not get rid of that global file system lock. I'll probably send another email about this in a week or so. You know, hey, did you get rid of your global file system lock? Just make sure that you do that. So, um, yes? Uh, when two processes write to the same part of the file, when you switch between mm. Very good question. I should probably talk about that a little bit. Um, so concurrent writers to the same chunk of the file. And of course, that could be a section that spans multiple sectors. It's okay for those writes to be interleaved in some way. Like our file system is not a database. And, and I, you know, I apologize because I don't remember which all of you have taken CS122. Databases are way stricter and more specific about this kind of stuff. File systems are just like, okay, I think this is okay. So, um, you know, if you had two writers writing to the same chunk of 10 sectors and they were interleaved in some way, so you saw process A's data in some of them and process B's data in some of them, that's totally fine. Okay? The main thing that we care about is appending. That has to be coordinated because you're updating metadata and file data itself. And if you don't keep those two things in sync, then typically the last guy wins and the first guy's stuff gets blown away. And so that can be really annoying. It can either lead to a corrupt file system or more typically it just leads to rights being lost at the end of the file. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions about that kind of thing? The assignment goes into more detail, so it'll spell out more details, but that's basically the guidelines. It's pretty lax, which is nice. It's, it's pretty typical to the way that real operating systems work, shockingly enough. Okay, which is why we have things like sync operations where you're like, all the stuff I've done, make sure it actually hits the platter, and then I'm going to start doing other stuff. And there's a few other mechanisms, but then uh, databases have to have something on top of that to actually coordinate things more carefully. Okay, so uh, file system cache, I say it's pretty straightforward to implement. It certainly will be after virtual memory. So um, the cache only has 64 entries in it. That's um, hard-coded, so guess what? You can declare an array or something like that. Um, the assignment kind of spells out pretty carefully that uh, both file data and metadata count against this. Um, by metadata, I mean inodes, and we'll talk about inodes in more detail uh, momentarily. But uh, the file system free space map, it, it actually interestingly says you don't have to count that if you don't want to. Okay, now um, what do we mean that, about that? Now the, the free space map is actually represented as a separate file. You may have noticed that the bitmap data structure in Pintos supports reading and writing to a file. Why in the world is that? Well, it's so that we can actually do this free space map really easily. And it's in a special file whose inode is hard-coded to a specific sector. And then obviously once you're done, the rest of the free space map can be wherever it wants on the disk. But uh, in general, the free space map is uh, hard-coded. Now, um, your in-memory representation, if you have that bitmap loaded in memory, you do not have to count that against the file system cache. That's really what the assignment is saying when it says you can exclude the free space map. Okay. 
So just worry about actual data blocks and meta metadata blocks for regular files and directories. That's really all you need to be uh, concerned about. All right, any questions about this general stuff? So that's pretty easy. Uh, here is an idea. Um, this is what I would do if I were in your shoes. So build the file system cache. So basically what you're trying to do is make it fast <laughs> by caching things and uh, make sure that all of your file system accesses use the cache. So now you're starting to go through the cache. See, when I look at these things, I'm trying to think, what order can I implement this functionality that will give me multiple stages along the way at which I can test the system and make sure that things haven't fallen all to hell? Okay? And so if I build this thing and still have a global file system lock, then at least I'm serving out of the cache. So I know that whatever cache lookup mechanism is still working, maybe I have some cache eviction mechanism, some simplistic one, like uh, a few of you had really entertaining, uh, you know, uh, virtual memory eviction policies initially, and it's great because it really forces the, the cache to work harder and so you can make sure that things don't suck. So you do those things, make sure your tests still pass so you haven't screwed up that part. And then you start making it more sophisticated. So you start adding in other kinds of locks. So some kind of per entry read write lock so that you can coordinate internal accesses, something like that. Um, make sure all your tests still pass. Now, what you'll probably find, now what I mean by all your tests is, is like the Project 4 tests. Yes, the Project 4 tests, because um, file extension probably will break until you actually build in uh, synchronization on the inodes themselves for file extension. But at least if you are governing concurrent accesses to um, disk blocks, then you should see a significant number of tests start, uh, you know, or I should say continue to pass, okay? And then, of course, you'll have any more advanced concurrency issues. All the advanced concurrency issues will then need to be resolved. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can approach this because getting this big concurrent beast working properly is going to be a challenge. It's probably going to be the biggest challenge of the assignment. Okay? That's an idea. Let me know if it doesn't work for you, and I'll take this slide out or change it. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> since this cache is a fixed size, yay, we can go ahead and just say here's an array and it's going to be in your kernels.data segment and then off you go, or maybe it'll be in VSS. Um, but anyway, you have a couple of interesting options. It's only 64 entries, and curiously, the, um, the grading guidelines for Pintos actually say it's okay to do a linear search to this cache. I was like, what? <laughs> that sounds terrible. But it's only 64 entries. So um, if you want to do that, then I suppose um, I certainly won't penalize you for it. Uh, so if you think that's the simplest way to do it, then go ahead and do that. Um, you can also use a hash table to look up the entry that corresponds to a, a specific sector to see if it's in the cache or not. This is where dragons start to rear their ugly heads. Oh, and I wanted to mention that, actually. On the um, earlier so slide, when I said you cannot have a global file system lock, you may have other global locks. I said generally you should avoid them. Um, really what you need to do is if you have any other global locks, be extraordinarily suspicious of them while you're implementing them. Hi. So um, just make sure that you, when you have other global locks, that you don't introduce limits on your concurrency in your system. And I'll talk about a specific one um, that is subtle and may be surprising. Okay? So anyway, uh, but here we have a hash table, or I'll just use that as an example. You could use a hash table to look up entries based on sector number, and then the entries will have some kind of lock associated with them as well to coordinate access. Multiple readers can acquire the lock, a single writer can acquire the lock at a time. Okay? And, uh, yeah, make sure that uh, you can evict things because that's going to be kind of key. Um, the assignment is very lenient. It says, you know, at least clock should be what you do, the minimum bar. But, you know, the funny thing is, is in the file system cache, you can get much more sophisticated than that because you know exactly when these accesses occur. They occur at a much coarser grain than memory accesses. So LRU is within grasp something more sophisticated like ARC or CAR would easily be within grasp. Um, you can do those kinds of things if you want. Or you could just do clock because that's real simple. Um, there's a few other policies that are interesting. Sometimes people try to do these things. I don't think I've ever personally seen anybody in CS124 try these kinds of things. But I've heard that um, people have tried these things at Stanford in their OS class. So you'd say, all right, file metadata is important. So maybe what I'll do is 
prefer to keep metadata in cache over actual file data when I need to evict things. So you could do something clever like a points-based NFU me uh, mechanism. Remember, NFU is not frequently used. The idea is that I have a periodic timer interrupt that scans through the cache, and any cache entry that's been accessed, I increment its count and then clear its access bit. So I basically do this, and whatever has the highest counts is the stuff that's accessed most frequently. And then anything with a low count, I just go ahead and evict. Okay. And then you can do clever things like say, well, it's metadata, so I'm going to give it two points instead of just one. So you can do something like that to uh, be a little bit more clever about how you decide what should stay around. Now you also have to keep in mind that NFU has limitations. Um, the one thing that we talk about in the virtual memory uh, lecture, which I reference here, is that if you have pages that get really high counts initially and then are never accessed again, they kind of stick around. So typically you need some kind of aging mechanism to make sure that counts don't stay high if they aren't accessed recently. So you have to, again, do some kind of blending of recency and frequency. Okay, so that's an idea. Um, one thing that you should be very careful to avoid is having a cache full of metadata and only like one disk data block. If you have that, your file system is going to be horribly slow. So uh, maybe don't do this at all. It's totally up to you. Okay. If I were you, I would probably, seriously, if I were you guys trying to implement this in the week and a half you have left, I would probably do clock. <laughs> Just get it done. Get the hell out. You know, <laughs> That's probably what I would do. It's only if you're one of those insane people that gets things done in three hours instead of 10 or whatever, or 50 <laughs> <laughs> I always weep a little bit when I see the uh, the times. I'm like, is that really that high? I don't know. I hope not, but it might be. So anyway, um, yeah, there's a lot of concurrent access scenarios that you have to think about. So this was a simple one. Process A wants to read sector 234, and the cache has a global hash table, okay, which is scary. But again, I think the bulk of the people that have taken this class have used a global hash table to look up cache entries. So process B, in the meantime, decides that it needs to load sector 216, and there's no space for it, so it decides to evict sector 234. So 234 is in the cache, and another process decides it wants to remove 234 so that it can read sector 216. So situations like these, you have to think through very carefully. You have a hash table that you're using for lookups. How do you guard concurrent manipulation of that hash table? Okay. Do you have another read-write lock so that I'm only reading the hash table? Well, how do you know you're only reading it? Because if your entry's not in there, you need to add it. So you have to think about all these kinds of scenarios very carefully. Okay. Can you have a situation where a process gets to a file system cache entry and then says, hey, wait a minute, this isn't the sector I was looking for. It's definitely possible in this project. And I'll point out some examples of of uh, why you might actually want this kind of approach, which is freakish, but it actually might be a good idea for you. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is the thing that I was telling about uh, global locks and global mappings. Okay, let's say that we have a global hash map or a hash table that maps sector numbers to cache entries and a lock to guard the hash map. And if you want to access a block in the cache, you have a process like this. Acquire my global lock that guards my hash. Okay, again, this is not the file system global lock. This is a lock guarding the hash table. Find the block in the cache, doing a hash lookup. Hey, it's in there. Okay, now I know what block to access. Then I acquire the blocks lock, and once I have the blocks lock, I can re release the global lock. Okay, and again, if you uh, remember from databases or from our brief discussion of. Um, what was it? Uh, read, copy, update. This is called crabbing because basically it's like uh, crabs sort of walk sideways and uh, they always have one foot planted and then they take the next step. So, uh, you know, in a, in a situation where you have a complex data structure, you have something locked and you know where you want to go. So you lock the next thing and then you unlock the thing that you were just on. So this is why we call it crabbing. Okay. This is generally going to be correct. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So this is kind of a natural analogous to like uh, pinning the frames in memory while you're like handling them. Yeah. 
Yeah, and pinning is another thing you will have to think about. Um, I don't mention pinning explicitly in this discussion, and I probably should, because pinning is pretty easy to implement with locks, <laughs> he says. So um, anyway, yeah, those kinds of situations, you'll definitely have situations where you want to pin things. I'm loading a page into the cache. I want to make sure that that cache entry can't be evicted while I'm loading. Situations like that. You'll have to think about these kinds of things. I'm writing back an entry to the disk. I need to make sure it's not evicted while I'm writing it back to the disk. Those kinds of situations. Okay. Um, yeah, and basically the guidelines for both projects 5 and 6, uh, that unfortunately you guys don't get to see. I've wondered sometimes about just sharing that because it's hard enough uh, as it is. But um, the guidelines basically say um, you know, you can implement pinning with a specific pin count or Boolean value or something like that, or you can just use locks. And the solution implementation uses locks to do pinning. Okay, let's see. So um, here's the issue with this approach. You have this global lock, and unfortunately it is held when slow things happen sometimes. Okay, this is the scenario. Kernel thread 1 performs a read on block B. Whatever block it is, we don't care. Kernel thread 2 chooses to evict block B, or really do anything else to it, but we'll look at eviction. And uh, kernel thread 3 does anything else on the cache. Okay? And you can have this series of operations occur. I get the global lock, because I'm kernel thread 1. I look up block B, I find it, then I acquire its lock, and then I release the global lock and start reading disk data into B, because maybe... Uh, yeah, so let's say that that second step is find block B in cache or add it if it's not there, you know, or something like that. And then uh, kernel thread 2 acquires a global lock, which it's allowed to do because kernel thread 1 has released it. And then it wants to evict block B, but B is locked. So now it's blocked on B's lock until kernel thread 1 finishes. Okay. But you see that since we're doing crabbing, it still holds the global file. Uh, not file system lock, it still holds the global cache lock. So kernel thread three, uh, 3 comes in, I want to access any other sector. I don't care about block B. But it's blocked on the global lock because kernel thread 2 is holding it while kernel thread 1 does something really slow. So you can see how um, this global lock on the cache can really hinder concurrency. Everybody see that? Any questions? These, these are straight out of the uh, TA guidelines slash solutions, so I'm giving you a huge hint by showing you this. Historically, many students have identified, I shouldn't say many, but a significant number of teams have identified this issue on their own and have resolved it. Um, so by me showing you this stuff, I, I kind of am expecting more. I want you to definitely think about these things in the design document discussions. I want you to tell us, well, how good does your solution handle these kinds of things? Does it avoid it? Is it limited by this? What are the characteristics of your system? So I'm pointing it out so you can all think about it. Is there a question, Colin? So we do have to handle this? You should handle this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should. In fact, the guidelines from Stanford say deduct if they don't. Um, I haven't decided if I will do that or not. It depends on my mood, how many late tokens you decide to use. All of that kind of stuff. So anyway. Um, I'm pointing this out because I want you to be aware of this issue and at least identify it in your implementation. I want you to resolve it too because the solution is not that hard. But uh, I want you to at least be aware of it and to talk about it and how your solution fares. Okay, so you have this solution. Um, I already mentioned this. The problem is that we have this global lock held until we get an entry lock and sometimes we do slow things to entries. Okay, so that holds everybody else up that wants the global lock. That becomes a contention point. So let's say that we changed our solution. We decide that crabbing sucks, and we're going to do something else. So now we acquire the global lock, we find our block, we release the global lock. Then we acquire the blocks lock, and we go on. Now everybody's allowed to proceed, right? What's the issue? Is there a question, comment? What's the issue here now? Something could get evicted. That certainly could happen. Any other issues? That one's probably enough. <laughs> that one's a big enough issue. 
So yeah, it allows kernel 3 to proceed, but we also now have new ways that these kernel thread executions can be interleaved. And this is both the really, this is the part that I love about this kind of programming, but it's also the part that makes it really <laughs> difficult. Is that you, when you write code, you have to think about all the possible interleavings. You have to keep that stuff in your head while you're writing the code so that you try to avoid bugs before you get stuck by them and then have crappy debuggers that can't help you very much because it's systems programming. It shouldn't be easy. Okay, so this is another thing that is now possible. So kernel thread 1 acquires the global lock, finds B, then it releases the global lock, and that allows kernel thread 2 to proceed, and it finds block B and evicts it. So now the entry says, I'm empty, or it says, I have a different sector, something like that. And then finally, kernel thread 1 receives B's lock because uh, kernel thread 2 released it finally, and it starts accessing B's data, and it's like, wait, what? I have what? This isn't B's data. I'm confused. Or it just says, hey, B's data is really cool, and it, you know, the system fails. Okay. So what is a solution to this? There is a solution. Global file system lock. Yes, that has been the solution of many students. <laughs> Much to their disappointment when they see their score. Yes. You can, uh, after you acquire B's lock in thread one, you can check to see if it's actually B's. Mm -hmm. That's exactly correct. Right. What we can do is acquire B's lock, and then make sure it's still B. <laughs> Have you had a, a crisis of identity since the last time I got you? So something like that. You can basically look and say, are you still B? If you do that, then that basically avoids the contention issue on the global lock. You can still have the global lock to make sure that your hash table doesn't get completely jacked uh, when you have concurrent threads manipulating it. Um, but then you still don't have these situations where the global lock becomes a point of contention on some of these slow, long-running operations. Okay? And if you open up the, you know, you acquire the lock on B and you're like, are you still B? And it's like, no, I'm actually somebody else now. Ha ha. Then you say, okay, well, fine, I'll release it. And then you go back and try again. Okay? That's basically the, the approach. Questions? Does this suck? A eh, little bit. Um, the way that you would describe this in concurrency discussions, um, which unfortunately, again, we don't really have any classes that talk about this kind of thing anymore. But this is kind of a more optimistic locking mechanism. When I design this, I am presuming that most of the time when I release the global lock and then acquire B's lock, that it'll still be B. <laughs> if most of the time it's not going to be B, then why would I even do this? Right? So we're being optimistic. And so this is one of the characteristics you have to think about when you design concurrent systems. Do I, can I take an optimistic approach? Or do I need to take a more pessimistic approach? And sometimes uh, optimism pays off, and you take these shortcuts, and most of the time you aren't wrong, and you get to uh, have a more efficient system. But if you have a, a system where your assumption doesn't hold most of the time, then you waste more time than you gain, and you should switch to a more pessimistic mechanism. Yes? Hey, why are we acquiring these lock before we're um, because of the things I was saying on like the last two or three slides, that the global lock uh, will be held, like if you have two threads that concurrently want to access a particular sector, and one of them is doing something really slow, then the other one may not get the sector's cache entry. It's, the fairness of it. it's not fairness. It's that the other, the other thread will have to wait to get the cache entry's lock, and it will be holding the global lock until it gets it. And that will hold up other threads that don't even care about that sector. That's the issue. It's spelled out very clearly a few slides back, so I would just say go back and look at those slides, and uh, it'll be as plain as day. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So that's some things to think about um, when you do this stuff. Okay. You, you. This is one way you have to think about it: the interleavings. The other way to think about it is. I'm kernel thread one, and I'm doing stuff. Well, I am accessing the cache entries, maybe sector ID, you know, sector number, what is in that cache entry. Um, the operating system might decide it wants to cache that in a register. 
because it sees you access it and then it sees you access it again and it's like, oh, I'm going to be fast. I'm going to make this really fast and just cache that in a register. And then the second time you look at B's entry, uh, its, its identity, and it's like, yeah, of course it's still the same because I cached it in a register. And that screws you over. Okay, So you have to think about these kinds of things as well. When you build these kinds of mechanisms, this is very similar to double check locking, which I'll talk about uh, in a few slides. When you have these kinds of situations, you need to make sure that the second access still goes against the actual contents of memory. So use volatile. That's really all you have to do is make sure you use volatile to force the access to occur again so that you can make sure you read the real value because somebody will be changing it concurrently. So these are the kinds of things to think about. Do I need volatile? Thankfully, you should not actually need barriers because of IA32 being nice to you. But um, at the very least, you'll probably need volatile for this. Okay? Important to think about. Okay, read-write lock. So typically you have to implement some kind of read-write lock, which I really prefer to call a shared exclusive lock because they're useful in so many different scenarios. And I don't like to think of them specifically in the context of reading and writing. Um, but you probably will call it a read-write lock in your implementation. Pintos doesn't have one, so you have to build one. And you need to think about fairness so that your system doesn't get starved. I don't know how much the uh, Pintos tests try to beat on this, but I have noticed that some people's file system submissions take forever. And I don't just mean because they had a, a global file system lock. It's a lot of times because they have unfair implementations that really penalize readers or they penalize writers. Okay? So here's one thing. If lock is currently held by readers and some other reader comes along, don't just blindly grant the lock to the new reader. Look at if you have waiting writers. If you do, make the reader wait too, because you want to be fair to the writer. If you have the lock released by a writer, don't automatically give the lock to the next writer. Because if you do that, then writers can actually starve out readers. Okay? I think there's a general uh, rule of this, which is if I'm a reader... And, uh, and, you know, if, if all the readers release the, the lock, give it to writers next. And if writer just released the lock, give it to readers next so that you make sure that everybody gets taken care of. You need to think about these kinds of things in your implementation so it, it's not miserably crappy. Okay? Now, one thing I will say is you don't need to think about lock request order. Like, super fair read-write locks think about request order. They were requested in this order. I want to make sure that they're granted in this order. Read-write locks are already kind of putting things, uh, you know, a little fuzzy in this area because they're like, okay, other readers come on in. Okay. So, you know, you don't have to be that fair. You just need to make sure that writers always eventually get it because they're not starved out by readers. And you need to make sure that readers also eventually get it in the context of many, many writers to a particular block. Okay? Those things to keep in mind. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to build a read-write read, write lock. You can look on uh, Wikipedia, for example. It has a very simple algorithm for building a read-write read, lock out of a mutex, um, which I actually probably wouldn't recommend because it's a little bit unfair, um, which is why I decided not to include it in the lecture. So, uh, but you can look at Wikipedia if you want to get an idea of how one might go about constructing a read-write lock from a mutex. Okay, so we have locks and condition variables in Pintos, which is really all you need. Um, basically, you need a lock to make things atomic as you're looking at what readers you have and what writers you have. And then you can basically use multiple condition variables to keep track of blocked readers and blocked writers. Okay? That tends to be the way that these things are constructed. Um, I don't know how much you all have, have had experience with this. Most of you have probably used a condition variable like one condition variable with one lock. But it's really neat about condition variables. You can actually have many condition variables coordinating on one lock. And you can do that kind of thing to build a read-write lock so that you have one condition variable for waiting readers and one condition variable for waiting writers. And then you can do something like that. What's the condition for the waiting readers? Well, there's no waiting writers and nobody's holding the lock. Yes, then I get to go. Um, if I am a waiting writer, what's the condition? There's nobody else holding the lock, and then I get to go. Yes, question? So can we abstract the read-write lock into like the sync.h file? Can you abstract it into sync.h? Yes, that would be awesome. 
I kind of would say please do that. Um, a lot of people don't. The solution doesn't. I almost penalized the solution. When I read it. I was like, in minus 10. But uh, yeah, so actually, um, a lot of people do that. They'll build a read-write lock. Um, a lot of people seem to throw it into their file system code. Um, but if you put it into sync.h, that would be even better. That would probably be a great way to avoid grumpy comments from Donnie. Okay. So, but yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so other state variables for, you know, is the lock... I like to keep track of the lock mode so that unlock can be a single simple operation instead of saying, like, read unlock, write unlock, because that's more bugs waiting to happen. Uh, a few other details as well. Um, there are a lot of variations. Like the solution implementation keeps track of number of waiting readers, number of waiting writers, number of readers, number of writers. I'm like, that's a lot of variables. Okay. You can kind of infer some of that from the condition variables and other things. But uh, you know, just be aware there's not a single right way to do it. Just come up with a way that works, and then that should get you moving. OK, yeah, so condition variables hold a queue of waiting threads. You can signal, hey, for writers, because that signal wakes up one. And you can broadcast, which wakes up everybody who's waiting, which is great for the, oh, you know what? This is a copy-paste error. Um, wake up all waiters. Yeah, OK, so that's right, because um, waiters and writers look very similar. Uh, but that way, you can get all your readers to go at once. All the waiting readers could automatically get to jump on it. And this is an example. If you wake up all the waiting readers when the writer releases, then that's an example where you're not necessarily granting the lock in request order, but who cares? You know, you just want to make sure that it's roughly fair. Final thing to say about condition variables. You cannot assume that because you woke up that the condition still holds because, well, things happen. So uh, typically, the way these condition variables have to be used, and I should say as an aside, the way that virtually every condition variable that I've ever used in my entire life has to be used is check your condition in a loop. While this condition's not true, wait on the condition variable. You go to sleep, you wake up, and you're like, hey, is the condition true yet? No? OK, go back to sleep. So that tends to be the way that you have to use condition variables in Java, in C, in C++. You go on forever. That's the way condition variables almost always work. OK, any questions on this? Condition variables, they're awesome. They're my favorite. OK, read ahead and write behind. You have to support read ahead and write behind on the file system. So how do we do this? Um, if a process reads sector n, the file system should prefetch sector n plus 1 in the background. Why do we do this? To basically improve sequential file access. It may screw up random access. But what can you do? Right behind, basically, periodically, the kernel should go through and write out dirty cache entries so that they're cheaper to evict and so that if your system crashes, you won't lose as much data. Okay. So again, what's the goal of this? Basically, to improve uh, robustness of the operating system. Okay. Uh, again, there's design document questions about these kinds of things related to read ahead and write behind. I expect you to have more detailed answers than what I just put on the slide, so don't just copy what the slide says or I'll be sad and take off points. So um, just think about these things in a little bit more detail. Okay, now these things need to happen in the background. How would I build something like this that needs to happen in the background? Timer would be one option. If I, if I have a timer, I mean I could do it on the timer interrupt handler, except that right behind can block because I'm writing to the disk. So I have to go to sleep. So I can't necessarily do it in interrupt context. What can I do? Kernel threads are your friend. This is probably the first time where you will spin up kernel threads specifically to take care of system services, system responsibilities that are not part of a process. OK? So in your file system initialization, you will likely start a couple of threads in this project to take care of these things. Some people do this with one. Most people do this with two threads. Okay? So you have a read ahead service that basically is some kernel thread that reads from a shared queue. So there's some locks on the queue so that you can access it. And basically all that shows up in the queue is sectors to read. It's like, oh, hey, I'd like you to read the sector. OK, I'll read the sector. That's all it does. And so the kernel thread that is doing the reading of sector n just dumps n plus 1 onto the queue. 
Okay? And so the read ahead thread just sits there waiting for things to show up. And when stuff shows up, it reads the sectors that it's supposed to. And by virtue of reading it, it automatically ends up in the file system buffer cache. Okay? How easy is this? I mean, it's not super easy. I wouldn't say to a high school programmer, hey, you should do this. It's like, but it should be straightforward for you all by now. Okay, right behind service, same thing. Another kernel thread that basically can sleep for a certain amount of time and then go through the file system cache, look for dirty pages, and write them back. Okay, that's basically it. Now, you can see here that the right behind service, since it is writing back stuff, it'll have to manipulate the cache entries, and it'll probably need to do some locking on the cache entries to make sure that they're uh, managed properly. Okay, questions? Hopefully this will make your life a little bit easier. This is the solution that most people choose, but I'm trying to help you uh, cut down a little bit of time on implementation by just saying, do it this way, because it'll probably not suck. It hasn't sucked most of the time. Okay, extendable files. So um, we have to support file extension. <clears throat> I don't know how I'm going to get through this all. I'll try to rush. So you need a free space map to know what sectors are available. It already exists, so you can leverage that. And you also need a more sophisticated inode structure, so you'll need that as well. Um, right now, the way they are is solely focused on single extent contiguous files that don't grow. You should feel absolutely free to change anything and everything in the implementation necessary to make extendable files that are not contiguous. Simple example, there's free map allocate, which takes you know, I'd like to allocate a number of sectors this many in size. Give me back the sector start that I get to have. Okay. Well, that's really designed for contiguous single extent files. So maybe you want to change it to allocate on a per sector basis, which is what the solution implementation does. Or maybe you want to say, hey, I want to allocate this. Here's an inode. You fill in the details. Okay. You have a couple of different options for how the uh, free map allocate operation could work to get more space for a file. Okay, So change it. Change it to whatever makes the most sense for your team. <clears throat> also, you are given that the file system partition will never be larger than 8 megabytes, or mebibytes, or 8 men in blacks, as I like to say. So um, basically, that's going to be 16K sectors, given our sector size. And uh, so the implications of this are that your free space map might be up to four sectors in size for the data. File inodes have to somehow index up to 16K sectors. And I say using some kind of multi-level indexing structure. They suggest ext2, but you're not required to do it. It's really too much for a single level indexing structure, unless you had your inodes be like four contiguous sectors or something like that, which would be kind of gross. Okay, so let me see. No, it'd have to be way more than four sectors, if I understand correctly, because you can only fit a maximum of 128 entries into a, a sector. So you need a lot of those to get up to 16384. All right, so yeah, the bitmap data structure, yeah, so that stuff is already in there. Okay, yeah, so this is basically important detail. These are examples of how we can leverage the file system to build the file system, which is kind of neat. So uh, free map is a file, but it's hard-coded to have an inode at sector 0. Okay, the inode will probably expand to cover... Uh, well, actually, no, that inode will be one block, but then the other four blocks could be anywhere. Okay, what is an inode? An inode is basically just the starting point for the indexing information and metadata for a file. Okay, it almost always occupies multiple sectors. It probably, on our implementation, will occupy non-contiguous sectors. And inode.c is confusing because it actually has two inode data structures. One is the disk representation, and the other is the in-memory representation. Okay? You probably will decouple these a little bit for this project, and like I say here, it will probably change significantly. For example, inode disk has unused, and it has a giant chunk of unused space. You will probably use all of that space okay, as you uh, redesign the uh, disk inode structure. Okay. Also, inode has an inode disk member. You probably won't do that after you have the file system cache because the inode disk will be in the cache. So maybe the inode has a pointer to the cache entry or maybe you just store the sector number so that you can look it up. That probably be the best way is to just have the sector number where the inode lives on disk. 
Okay? And like I say here, the cache entry will have some block of data. You can just cast that into an inode disk star and access the members if you want. Don't you love C? You do crap like that without any problem. Any questions? Okay, so that's inodes. Let me see. Yeah, so ext2 like. Um, if you follow it, which again, virtually all people that have taken this class have done it, that's perfectly fine. Some number of direct nodes, some number of single indirect nodes, some number of double indirect nodes, and thankfully no triple indirect nodes because you don't need them for 8 megabytes. Direct nodes, like I said, 512 byte block can store 128 entries. And so 128 sectors times 512 bytes per sector gives you 64K files. That's with only direct blocks. If you do single indirect block, then you know one single indirect block points to another block with indexing stuff. So each index block that you add will be another 64K. So if you had one single indirect block, you would get 128K files. So you can see that that is uh, still limiting. Okay. But you have to decide how many single indirect and double indirect entries to have. Okay. You should make sure that they're greater than zero if you happen to take this approach. Um, but you should use as few as possible just to keep things simple. I've seen various solutions to this. I've seen probably two or three single indirect and then a double indirect. I've seen all kinds of things. But it's eight megs. You don't need that many. So just do the math. Figure it out. Keep it simple. Get it done. Get, get this class over with. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so here's a simple example. Um, basically, you have choices as to how you lay this stuff out on the disk. You could keep all of your inode entries in a single array, or you could have multiple variables. The data layout on the disk will be identical, but now you have more semantic information in your implementation that you can rely on. So I prefer the second approach. I suggest you follow it. I probably will not penalize you if you don't, unless your code makes me vomit. And so, uh, but just be aware that if you can work more semantic information into your code and make it easier to understand, it is totally worth it because it's hard enough to understand. Questions? Okay, so there's some details there. File extension, multiple processes. Yeah, it has to be atomic um, just because those things have to be kept in sync. So in memory inodes, we'll need some kind of lock. And uh, of course, reads and writes within the file can happen concurrently, but you'll rely on the buffer caches to keep track of that stuff. So the buffer cache entries will have locks. You can use those locks to govern uh, reads and writes inside the file, but extension needs to be governed elsewhere. How do you tell if you're extending the file? Well, if the write somehow falls past the end of the current file's length, then it's growing. You're extending it. So you need to make sure that you acquire that file extension lock. Okay, otherwise, you can just rely on the file system cache. You certainly could have writes that start before the end and then go past the end. So just be aware of all of those kinds of fun things, which I'm sure the Pintos tests will try on your implementation. Okay, so the nice thing is, is that uh, in Project 6 and in all the projects, the file system is not supporting shrinking files. So if you decide that something is inside the file, it will always be inside the file because the file size only grows. So you don't have to worry about, I think it's inside, and then suddenly somebody truncates and it's now outside. You don't have to worry about that. So that makes it kind of simple. OK, so two choices. A question? So this is kind of like analogous to the stack row divisive heuristic to determine if the... Yeah, you'll need some kind of heuristic, but the heuristic is really simple. It's like if the end of the data being written falls past the length of the file, it's, a, it's an extension. Yeah, and that's really all you have to do. You can have a lock on the file that basically governs that. Okay, so yeah, two choices. Always lock the file extension lock before checking the length. So that's nice. You can get it right. But the problem is now that again becomes a single point of contention. Because I have to acquire that lock for any reader, right? Because I need to check it first. And if it happens to be that somebody is doing an extension and somebody else then wants to do another extension afterward and you just want to write somewhere inside the file, you're stuck. Back of the queue. You have to wait for all those people to finish doing their really long, slow operations before you can just check the file size. 
Okay? So again, this is a limitation to concurrency. You should try to avoid this if you possibly can. I'll probably be limit, you know, I'll be nice this term, but next year definitely I'm going to start forcing people to do these things because it's really important. Okay, so the other option is to use double check locking. What is double check locking? Well, I check without a lock, I'm optimistic, and then I double check to make sure that my answer is correct. So if the right position is past the file, I say, well, I might be extending it, but something might happen in between. Notice I haven't acquired any locks yet. So I double check. I acquire the file extension lock because it looks like I might be extending it. And then I check again. Oh, that clock is slow. I apologize. We're about five minutes ahead of that clock. So um, basically, you can use this mechanism to make sure that you're actually extending the file and you don't uh, unnecessarily limit your concurrency. Okay. If you fall through that stuff, notice I have a return in there. If you fall down through those cases, then it's because you're actually writing to the interior. Okay, So most of the time when you check this, you'll be on the interior, you're being optimistic again, and uh, in those few situations where it looks like you're extending, you can, re you, know, you can acquire the lock, check your answer again, make sure that it's still right, and then you can go on. Okay, any questions? Now, double check locking is like one of the riskiest things you can do. Again, you have these, these two operations that are identical. The only difference is that they're separated by a lock, and compilers are frequently dicks about this kind of thing. And uh, the compiler can really mess with stuff. So how do you resolve this? Same way as always. Make it volatile. Use a barrier. Thankfully, you don't have to use a read barrier on IA32. Just make sure it's volatile so you can force the compiler not to optimize this second access array. Okay, questions? Yes? So we can use the volatile keyword as a cast. You can cast something as volatile, yes. So you would probably need to cast it as a volatile inode star or something like that. And, uh, well, actually, yeah, that might work. I, you have to experiment. I'm not entirely sure which part you have to cast as volatile, but you need to make sure the compiler knows it has to perform the read again. Okay? All right, well, you know what? Uh, the rest of this stuff you can read on your own. This is just uh, the solution as a clever trick to make sure that extensions to the file aren't visible to readers until they're completed. You have these various operations. If you think about what thing should come last so that the write actually becomes visible to other parts of the program, then uh, you, can, you can make your code pretty clever. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be tests on that. So I'm going to just go ahead and uh, breeze through that. Now directories, there's really only one thing. I'm, I'm kind of sad that I don't get to spend more time on this. Directories are basically special files read by the file system. So they're files, but they're directory files as opposed to normal files. Okay. So again, what you can do to your inodes is add something that says this is a directory, this is a normal file. And then you can basically use the directory file yourself and then you can have basically unlimited size directories. Okay, that's how Unix does. I don't know if any of you have done like ls-l and noticed that different directories are different sizes, because the file that's backing the directory is a different size because the directory has a lot of junk in it. Okay. Anyway, so you can read about this stuff. I just wanted to point that out real quick. Uh, make sure again that you have directory locks, not global locks, if you can possibly avoid it. Okay. And then the last thing that I talk about in this is basically how do you uh, govern in-use directories, in-use files, things like that. So um, you don't have to do too much with this. You're, and again, you're given a lot of leeway by the project, but you do need to talk about this stuff in your design document. So this is an approach that you can use for this kind of stuff. Okay, so that basically should be it. Make sure that you bug me if you have questions. A lot of teams have been making use of me, and that's great. That's my job. Um, so keep it up. Uh, use Piazza. And again, just please make sure to ask me before using late tokens on the, on the last project because I do have to get this all graded really quickly. I will do my best. We can negotiate ease. I can try to stall the registrar. But if everybody asks for an extension, then I'm basically host. So I just want to make sure that we try to avoid that scenario. All right. Any questions? Good luck, everybody. See you Wednesday, maybe.